Cool. Now, thank you everyone for being here. Um, our speaker today is Mark Vila who's a postdoc at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and the Department of Physics um, of the University of California, Berkeley. He completed his Bachelor in Nanoscience and Nanotechnology from the Autonomous University of Barcelona and obtained his PhD in theoretical physics from the same university in 2020. Um, his PhD research carried out at the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology focused on the theoretical exploration of spin transport in two-dimensional quantum materials such as graphene, transition metal dichalcogenides, and topological insulators. Currently, he's interested in transport properties of magnetic materials and spin orbitronics, i.e. the usage of spin orbit coupling to envision spintronic applications and topological states of matter. So thank you so much for being here. Now, uh, I think, yes. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity for me to present a little bit of my knowledge. So, um, let's. Is there a way to remove this part here? Because uh, in the Zoom, people see it all right, right? But like for the... Nice, okay, now we're all set. So again, thank you a lot for the opportunity to be, to be here. I'm Mark and I'm a postdoc at the Department of, of Physics here at Berkeley. And today we'll talk about uh, nanoscience and nanotechnology. First, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm from Spain, and it's for a small town near Barcelona in the northeast of Spain. A small village, like only 4,000 people living in it, and it's a medieval town which is surrounded with with walls. And there is also there is, this is a, an active volcano. Hopefully, it will stay like that forever. And as uh, and in terms of my education, I did my bachelor in nanoscience and nanotechnology. This is kind of a rare bachelor. Usually it is chemistry, physics, mathematics, biology, biotechnology. But uh, in Spain uh, at that time, there appeared this new bachelor of nanoscience and nanotechnology, which at that time I didn't know actually what that meant. Um, and, I, uh, and that was very nice. And usually there are masters on that and PhD programs on nanotechnology, but not a bachelor, which is uh, 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 which that was quite interesting to me. And then after finishing that, I did a master's in nanomaterials in, in London. And finally, I moved back to Spain again, and I did my PhD in, in physics, more specific in physics, uh, in condensed matter physics. And I feel I'm quite suitable, um, at least I'm quite confident to try to explain you things about nanoscience and nanotechnology, even my, and my, not even my master's, but also my bachelor was on that. So even though now I'm a physicist and I don't do any chemistry or any biology, I still like what nanoscience and, and, and nanotechnology entails. And that's what I, I will try to explain to you today. So first, uh, uh, I would like to know to ask you, uh, well, I don't know with the audience that I have today, whether it's grad students, undergrad students, or even people from outside the university, I would like to know uh, what people know about this topic. So if, uh, if any of you would like to share, what do you think nanoscience and nanotechnology is? If you would like to try, I mean, it's not complicated, or even in the Zoom, if somebody wants to write it down, but I have, uh, <laughs> yes. So I think nanoscience is um, doing science at the nanoscopic scale, so like 10 to the negative 9 meters, nanometers, and maybe a little bit above in single microns, maybe a little bit below. Um, yeah, that's basically it. 
Okay. So, uh, the, since he already nailed it, I'm just going to move forward. <laughs> so, the outline of, the, of my talk first, I will try to, uh, so we will go to the nano wall. We will try to see how much, how small is actually a, a nanometer. So that, that's the length scales we will be dealing with. Then, since th these are very small things, how can we look at them? And then I will spice things up a little bit with some games and curiosities. So uh, in the world that we live in, we use length scales to measure things typically, and they should be quote unquote, because in, these is, are not used in US, because uh, here we, you guys use uh, inches and foots uh, as a length scale, but like at least in the international science, uh, like the, 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 the units, we use meters, kilometers, centimeters, but this is just only a, a few range of dimensions. We can go larger and smaller. So to understand, since we can see, since we can look at large things, but we cannot actually see small things, after we go up in the length scale uh, to, so yeah, that a person or animal are things that are in the length scale of a meter. So now to understand how small things are, first I will go up, for example, my town, or in general, any town, any city, it's like uh, one kilometer, more or less in extension, like this is 10 to the three meters. Then if you still go up, uh, you go 10 to the six, that's like uh, one million meters or 1000 kilometers. That's like a country, for example, like Spain. And then if you still go up in scale, for example, a star, like the sun, that's uh, one million meters, sorry, one billion meters, which is 10 to the nine uh, meters. Okay, so, you know, the sun is pretty big, right? It's 10 to the nine meters in comparison to myself, that's pretty small in comparison with the sun. So, okay, let's go back to myself. Now, let's go down in the scale. Um, we have the millimeter, which is 10 to the minus three meters. These things, we, start with, we, we still can see them, like uh, ants, uh, small animals, like the, the, that, that's, we use a ruler to measure this scale. Then uh, 10 to the minus four meters or 0.1 millimeter, that's like the hair thickness or the paper thickness. Uh, 0 0.01 millimeter or 10 to the minus five meters. Now we start to go quite a small, like in the, that's the size of a cell, for example. And if we still go down, then we reach a micrometer. That's common, commonly used uh, like the scale in physics or, or in science in general. For example, that's the size of a bacteria or the organelles and things that are inside of a cell. But that's still not small enough. We can still go down. Then if we go 10 to the minus seven meters, we reach the viruses. If we go 10 to the minus eight, which is even smaller than a virus, we reach things like the components inside our computers, like all the electronic devices have length scales of this order of magnitude. Then if we go another step forward, we reach a nanometer, which is 0.0000001 meter or 10 to, uh, 10 to the minus nine meters. And that's a length scale of DNA or molecules, for example. And I guess uh, from here forward, we, we cannot see these things with the naked eye. So just to clarify, if we put ourselves in comparison with a sugar molecule, the sugar molecule is as small in comparison to us that we are to the sun. But nevertheless, we want to work with these things and we want to study these things, even though they are so small. That's like if the sun or other planets would like to study us. So it's super, super small. But uh, nanometer is just the length scale, but nanoscience and nanotechnology it revolves around, I mean, it's not just one nanometer. In general, nanoscience and nanotechnology studies all the things that lay around a uh, few hundreds of nanometers like viruses and down to like 0.1 nanometers, a uh, fraction of a nanometer like the atoms. So all this window of scale here, this is, this is what nanoscience and nanotechnology works with. So that involves, and that's by definition, that means that this science is multidisciplinary. So you can, 
to chemistry and within chemistry you can do nanoscience you can be a physicist and do nanoscience that goes on and on in medicine like to, to make uh, new um, drugs for example electronics in building more powerful and smaller computers material science to engineer better uh, materials and any any branch of science and technology that can kind of study those small length scales that, that could be term nanoscience and nanotechnology so now hopefully we understand a little bit better why is that so how small is a nanometer but so what what can we do with that and the thing is that when you go such in a such uh, down in the scale new phenomena and properties appear so that's very cool because we can try to study them in order to uh, obtain some functionalities and create some new technology that we can apply for our benefit so that's what would be maybe that could be a distinction between nanoscience and nanotechnology like the more uh study fundamental things which would be more nanoscience or apply them into a some application would be more uh, nanotechnology and for example let's take it what what new phenomenon properties can we expect when we go in a such scales for example the the gold the piece of gold is the color is gold as the name it says but when you start chopping this down and make very fine as, as small particles of gold, uh, like nanoparticles, you find that the, the color of the gold is, not, is no longer gold. For example, there are different vials with different solutions of different nanoparticle sizes. And uh, as the figure implies, uh, depending on the size of the nanoparticle, you find different colors. And that's, that's because um, due to the shape and size of the particle, the light interacts differently with this object. And then the light scatters and reflects in a different way. And then the color that you see as a human is, is different. And this is something made at the lab, right? But nanoscience or this phenomena is not something that we have invented. This appear, this exists in the nature. And actually we, we have been doing that for a long time. For example, if you go to cathedrals or churches, and you see these uh, beautiful uh, crystals. Actually, uh, if, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, so to make the color, to make the shiny colors of these crystals, the people that made the crystal, they had to polish and grind some metals and, and mix some materials. And during that procedure, uh, the, 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 the sizes of the metals that, that, that produces these bright colors are actually sizes of the other nanometer. So without knowing the people that made these crystals, they were actually doing nanotechnology because they were using, they were grinding the metals down to such a small length scales and that they didn't know what, what they were doing in that sense, but they knew that that, that would confine, that that would produce this colorful uh, and bright colors. So yeah, nanoscience is nothing new, but it's, I mean, it's in the nature and we have been using that. It's only that now we are able to understand it better. So um, now let's let's keep going. So we understand how small a thing and a particle is, for example. We understand uh, why we want to study them. But now, if we actually want to study them, how do we how do we interact with those small things? Can we use a microscope like, like this? The answer is no, because the resolution of this device is at maximum and at best around 2,200 nanometers, and that's not enough. So what do we do? We build a nanoscope, and by nanoscope I mean some device, some kind of microscope that we have changed and modified, so we can actually increase the resolution and, and see nano, nano uh, things in the nanoscale. Of course, this will not work in the same way. A typical microscope uh, uses light as a way to interact with the object and you'll be able to see it. But the nanoscopes that are more uh, often used, instead of light, they use other mechanisms, for example, electrons to see the materials or a kind of braille kind of uh, microscope which works very different and we'll explain it in a bit. 
Um, actually, that's yes. Now I will uh, ask for a volunteer if somebody wants to, to participate. Nice. Uh, are you okay? Uh, by so since we are doing a hybrid format, are you okay by placing yourself here so that the people can see you? Okay. What's your name? Herman. Herman, nice to meet you. Okay, now I need you to cover your eyes somehow. <laughs> Sorry. I'll, I'll just close my eyes. Is okay. That, is that okay? Yes. Oh, uh, uh, that, that. oh sorry. Hello. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, that, that's better. Okay, close your eyes. Okay, now you will become a nanoscope. Okay? Okay. Okay. Can open your eyes. I can open my eyes. No, no, yeah, keep closing them. Okay. okay. It's a very simple example and experiment, but that will, that will do the trick. Now you have to choose one finger. Um, yes, that, that will work. Okay, now I will place an object in front of you. Okay. And without opening your eyes, you need to identify what object is. Okay. <laughs> Some cardboard thing. Yes. You, you oh, it's an egg carton. Yes. Yeah. Open your eyes. Yes, correct. That's very easy. But uh, that's so now, uh, Herman, you have become this third microscope. As I will, <laughs> this uh, kind of microscopes are called a scanning, a scanning probe microscope, uh, because you use a touch to identify surfaces of materials. So in this, in this device, in this head of the microscope, there is a small lever like this and at the end of the lever there is an even a smaller tip and if you see the scale this is five micrometers this means that like yeah, this this width is like five micrometers then this width might be small smaller than one micrometer so then imagine like the tip of the tip this is of the order of few nanometers so basically uh the tip just scans to the surface of a material and just by, by, by following that the, the topography, you are able to, to draw the surface of a nanomaterial. For example, if you have a surface which is covered with this molecule, which I don't know the name, <laughs> um, uh, that's, so you, you can use this kind of microscopes to visualize the, the, the surface covered by this, this, this molecule. For example, these are, so in this surface, a tip has passed through the surface and have um, recorded the, the morphology. So this is like a 3D image of the, of the surface and this is like a, a 2D image of the surface. And there are, mainly two, there are mainly two different microscopes, one called atomic force microscope, which is the one that Herman demonstrated. And then there is another called scanning tunneling microscopy, which is more or less the same uh, mechanism, but a little bit different as well. And this is a very uh, nice example that some people, I think in, in the 90s, they, 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 they did this work. So this, this kind of, this microscope started at the 80s, 90s, so 40 years ago. And basically what this depicts, this is a, what's called a quantum coral. And each dot here that you see, this is a single atom of iron. So it's a very small uh, dimensions, very small surface. And what this, in addition to um, draw the morphology of a surface, these microscopes also can interact with the things on top of the surface. And what they did is they, with the tip of the microscope, they pick each atom and they place it in the way they want it. So here, the atoms are sc scrambled. They are not very well organized, but they, with the tip of the microscope, they were able to pick one atom and place it next to the other one and keep doing that until they form a, a perfect cir uh, circle. And this is, and this was, I mean, this was, I mean, to me, that's very impressive. But in addition, you see these waves, these are, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, these are the wave functions of the system. Or like, I don't know if from the surface or from the atoms, but this was a way to generate standing waves. Like, you know, this like, this, 
one nanometer of a distance. So it's like a stand, like the smallest, smaller standing wave that you can imagine. And yes, I wanted to show, uh, yes, a, a video if, I, if I'm able. Yes, so now I just described, I just showed the quantum coral example, but this is another video that I think IBM did. So basically they, they just created a movie based on this microscope. So all these tiny dots are single atoms. And each frame of the movie is one. So they pick an atom, they move it, and then they stop, and then they scan through the surface to, to visualize the surface, and then they repeat that again. So it's a lot of work. The plot is not very intriguing, but uh, it's very impressive. <laughs> wow. What kind of atoms did you say there? These ones, I, I don't know. Uh, I guess. Uh, I think I remember, I mean, I read about that at some point. There had to be some atom which is not very reactive, because otherwise it would just cluster. But, uh, yes. Did you make the atoms transport stuff like that? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
wait until I give you a code. And Um, classic mode. There's some tricky music in the background. So you have to go to this website, website and put this number in it. In Zoom, people can see that as well, right? Okay. I'm gonna go to screen. <laughs> oh. How many people are on Zoom? was from Zoom, I guess. You guys are in? Okay. You already know, know the first one. This is actually the, the, the first one. So this is just, this, the following images are just electron microscope images and you will have, you will try to uh, guess which picture is it. For example, here you have this thing and you have four options and you have to click on this, your mobile phone, the one that you're and it's the correct one. So yeah, all of you answered it correctly. But the next ones are gonna be a little bit more difficult. Oh yeah, and depending on how fast you answer and the, the, whether you do it well or not, you will get more points. Like John, John were you? You were, you were, you were John? Yes. Yeah. yeah, you were the fastest, so you get most points than the other people. The second one. There are ten questions. Oh. Well, now it's not that easy, right? <laughs> now we got uh, seven and one. The brown sugar uh, was the correct one. Okay, next one. Seven and one, okay. Let's see. Oops. That's the highest answer. I don't know what that means, but congratulations. <laughs> but John is still uh, number one. Uh, oh, only one person answered correctly. Who, who was any of you? <laughs> or it was air airworks, yeah. <laughs> nice. So, airworks, okay, yes. People fail for that one. Oops. Oh, no. And uh, comma breaker, for players just drop their answers. Uh, <laughs> yes. 
I mean, uh, the first one, everybody got it right, but after that, at least somebody got it wrong at other, other, other ones. It's not that it's... Shan is still number one. <laughs> oh, yeah, <No>. man. <laughs> 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 I, I, I guess you guys, you just click that for fun, I guess. Because there is no way. <laughs> Did somebody actually thought that that was the apps of a mosquito? <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> oh, the first one that nobody answers correctly. I mean, of course, it was like a very, very, very detailed part of the leaf. Of course, it's not a whole leaf, but uh, that's part of the leaf, apparently. Uh, just a disclaimer, I did not take these pictures myself. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know? Have you know? Uh, Which one did you choose? Just chest. Just nice. Why? It's the very, very nice thing that How have you seen it before? I'm just kidding. Which means false then? I'm losing. <laughs> Oh, I'm not working. <laughs> Ooh. I mean, now th there is the last the last question. So I guess. Is it worth like double points? <laughs> I don't know how much. I guess. I don't know how much point you get. I guess one thousand is the maximum. But I guess you guys, it's now or never. Super easy, right? <laughs> so let's see. And third place. And third place. Congratulations. Then you were not even in that. Nice. This is a fun way to learn uh, at least to see these images. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, I don't have any prize for you. Just be proud of yourself. <laughs> oh, <Chad. Sorry. laughs> And oh, yeah, and the music. Oh. Yes. So I will not enter in detail. I will not explain the, the mechanisms and how this works. So and I hope that you got acquainted with this microscope, at least with this with this game. What is this? Why do <laughs> Where did it come from? Like from the. Oh, is it the Yeah. Oh, okay. Nice. okay, let's move to the final stage of the presentation. Now you know pretty well the wall, the, the nano wall. Now let's go a little bit 
little applications and some products or some things that you can actually use. And for that, I will introduce you guys to a very special guest. Uh, well, not yet, sorry. So first I need to ask you one question. What, what all these things have in common? Yeah, they are common. I was trying to remove this, this thing, but uh, I click, I guess I have to go. Oh, never mind. Yeah. So they, these things are about carbon, but I think the way that it works is that carbon arranges in different configurations, different chemical bonds. So you have diamond in which the atoms, each atom bonds to other four atoms, and you have a very strong lattice of carbon. Amorphous carbon is the opposite. Carbons are just arranged in a random manner. And then you have graphite in which you have like this stack layers. So you have two dimensional. So carbons are just, just bond each other like in a 2D plane, but then these 2D planes are stacked on top of each other. Why am I telling you this? Because I will introduce you our new, our new guest. Maybe you know about it, maybe you don't know. But our new guest has the following properties. Uh, it's very, very stiff. It's uh, up to 200 times more strong and stiffer than steel. But in the same time, it's very flexible. Also, it's very light. For example, if you cover a football field with this material, the weight of this material would just be one gram. It's also transparent and it uh, conducts very well the, the heat. It's 50 times best, a better uh, thermal conductor than the copper. And it's also the best electrical conductor, conducts electricity better than silicon or silver, for example. Do you guys know which material I'm talking about? Yes. Oh, I, I, it's worth an oil price, this material. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, as you might know, because now it's quite famous, the material, the material I'm talking about is graphene. Graphene. Graphene is just each of these two dimensional uh, carbon sheets that form graphite. So if you take graphene and you start piling them up, you, have, you get graphite. And graphite is just what you use in your pencils to write. So, so actually it's a pretty simple material. And the way that you can obtain it, it's actually pretty simple as well. So I have another video for you. So how, how do you get graphene to make things with it. I mean, there are different chemical and physical ways to create graphene, like to, to, to grow it or to obtain it. At this, the following video explains the first way that researchers obtain graphene. And it's actually very simple. And, they, and uh, since then, people have used the same technique to obtain other materials. Take a scotch tape. Oh, I'm just, I'm just gonna, so, uh, you just take a scotch tape. <laughs> then you need to take some flakes of graphite. I mean, of course, this cannot be your pencil graphite. This has to be like good quality graphite. And then, then you just need to start peeling this graphite. Because we know that the graphite is made of graphene, right? And graphene is just one to the layer of the gra of graphite. So if you just naively, if you just keep peeling graphite off, at the end, you will get very thin uh, layers of graphite and that's graphene. So if you keep doing that, each time you exfoliate, you get you have the graphite on the scotch tape. And then after that, uh, you just press the film onto the, some wafer or some substrate. And hopefully some of the flakes in the scotch tape will be transferred onto this wafer. You take this and now you can go to your normal microscope. You don't need any fancy one for this. And you just, if you're lucky, you will find some flakes. 
And depending on the thickness of the graphene, like of the number of layers, you will have different contrast in the microscope. And for example, I guess the bottom right of this one is one single layer of graphene. I mean, uh, of course, then you need to measure it with other, other techniques to make sure that that's single layer, but this quite easy and a less fast way to make graphene in the lab. So as I said, graphene has a lot of nice properties. And since it, is, it was discovered in 2005, and since then it has changed the field of, of physics and chemistry. And I mean, now there is a field called 2D materials, which not only comprises graphene, but comprises also many other materials, which are literally 2D, just a one layer of atoms in, in a 2D plane. And to get you a flavor of how big is the market or, or, or like the interest for graphene. For example, between 2010 and 2020 in Europe, uh, the, the European Union spent $1 billion, sorry, 1 billion euros in, in projects only for this material. And also in right now, there are many centers in the, like there are many research centers throughout the world that focus only on graphene and two dimensional materials. And since it's flexible, strong, conducts heat, conducts electricity, is, is transparent, it can be used in many applications. For example, it can be used as sensors because you put, so you put some, something, a sensor is something that you responds. So if you, if you want a sensor that detects uh, some kind of gas, so basically the sensor needs to respond differently whether you have the gas present or not. So then since graphene conducts super well electricity, then when you when you put once you put some molecule of the gas or whatever on top of graphene, the conductivity change quite a lot. So then you are measured, you, you are able to measure it because it has a lot of sensitivity. So that's why it can be used as sensors. It can be used also for energy, like in uh, photovoltaics. Uh, you can since it's it's very flexible and strong, but also very light. You can mix it with other materials, and you can make alloys and and stronger and lighter materials for, for cars or for planes for, for light construction. And also for electronics, since and that's one of the major things that are being researched worldwide using these three materials and graphene for electronics. Because uh, if, you, if you have your computer, uh, the, the computer that you have now, comparison with the computer you had like 15 years ago, it's much more powerful. And also it has all the components in the computer nowadays are much more smaller so basically in the electronics industry you want to get your devices make it small and so in this way you can put more of them in the same place so you have more power so graphene since this 2d material so it's the thickness is less than one nanometer. So that means that you can it's intrinsically small so it's very uh interesting for electronics because in this way you can easily put a lot of materials uh and you, you, you can have a, a great density of components in using these three materials. And I will now explain very hand wavy why I like, why, well, the, the difference between graphene and other materials uh, when it comes to the high electrical conductivity. So imagine that you work with a, um, a, micro, a microscopic object. So then classical physics is what dictates the behavior. So uh, if you have Messi right, to, to score a goal and it shoots the ball and the ball uh, reaches a wall, since classical physics governs what's happening, the ball will be bounced off because the ball cannot penetrate the wall. Then, but then if Messi was behaving like quantum physics, then some of the, a few times that he shoot the, he shoot the ball, the ball a few times would pass through the, the wall. That's known as quantum tunneling. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but that's a big difference of quantum physics with respect to classical physics. But then you have gra graphene. And graphene, in some specific uh, scenarios, not all the time, but some specific circumstances, if, if Messi was uh, dealing with graphene in those specific scenarios, 100% of the time that he, that he would shoot the ball, it will always go into gold. So uh, of course, there is a, some physics behind that explains all this. But uh, 
graphene was, I guess, the first material uh, shown to exhibit this kind of property. And that's why graphene conducts electricity very, very well. But graphene is not the end of the world. There are, there are other many nanomaterials that are actually being used nowadays. For example, I'm going to ask you which of these things on the screen do you think have nanomaterials in it? Well, the answer is all of them. For example, this one, this uh, baking uh, tray, is covered with a nanofilm, which just prevents things to, to stick. Uh, this teddy bear has on it uh, silver nanoparticles. Silver uh, is a uh, silver nanoparticles are good to kill bacteria. So it's, a, it's like, a, uh, yeah, if you want to protect your child, yeah, <laughs> you just cover this with nanoparticles. And then the, at least the, the, the bear will not have bacteria. Maybe the, hopefully the child will not swallow the nanoparticles, but that's another story. Then uh, the tennis racket is a very good example of what I said earlier. If you mix graphene with other materials that made carbon bracket, the, the, the racket, you will make the racket more resistant, but also lighter. And finally, in this uh, sunscreen, you have titanium oxide nanoparticles that this absorb very efficiently on the UV, UV light. And before finishing, I will show you a video of another product, which is also a little mind blowing to me. This video is already a few years old, so I guess you could be able to buy this. It's called Never Wet. The video is quite long, so I'm just going to put the highlights. Is a two part super hydrophobic coating. You spray a base. Neverwet is a two part super hydrophobic coating. You spray a base. You'll give it about 15 minutes to dry, and then you spray a top coat. And after another 15 minutes or so, it's ready to go. It resists all sorts of waters, uh, aqueous solutions, salt solutions, acids, bases. Um, you know, most of the foods you eat, it resists quite well. Um, we have partnered in the last year with Rust-Oleum, and they have brought all of their expertise to what we're doing as well, which has been tremendously helpful. And now we're launching across the we United States. Friday, you cover, I guess. The outer section was treated with the coating. The center was just untreated glass. So when you put the water on it, the water will, the colored water will stick to the uncoated glass, but it will not go out of that section onto the coated surface. I applied a couple thin layers of the base coat and allowed that to dry so it wasn't tacky. And then I covered that with just a couple layers of the top coat. This is going to show that um, liquids won't stick and it's just easy cleanup. So we have a, an uncoated toilet brush and a coated toilet it's brush. You see the difference. Example. So if you're you know, cleaning your toilet, it would be great if things didn't stick to it after you were done. So uncoated one and you just clean things and uh, pretty drippy, kind of nasty. So coated one will come out with no drips. wine vinegar and we have yellow mustard and you are syrup. The time of your we life. are going to pour them directly on the shoes just like as if you were using it and actually accidentally trip on your shoes the shoes are coated with uh, our never wet uh, product which is by rust -Oleum. Right, so, so some of the mustard will stuck because of the fibers, but then the, it doesn't stick to it. So it, when you put water on it, it takes it right off. You're at a summer picnic and you've got a case of beer or soda or something like that. Um, you want to keep it cold. Instead of taking it all out and putting it in the cooler, you could coat the inside of the box that they came in and just fill that with ice. And as the ice melts, it's not going to make the container all soggy and wet because you've got it coated never wet. So basically, essentially, you have a cooler for your beer where the water will just flow right out of it, the box stays dry, and you've got your ice cold, ice cold beer. So today we have yellow mustard. Uh, with so well, that's a pretty graphic example of nano, a nanotechnology product. Basically, when this spray covers the surface, it puts uh, some molecules that, that are arranged on the surface, and these molecules have some chemical properties that repel 
uh, water and I guess other fluids as well. So in this way, it just is like a, a barrier to the object. So the water never gets to wet the actual material. So I think we reached the end. So as a take home message for you guys, I just wanna say that Remember, a nanometer is 10 to the minus nine meters. Uh, nanotechnology, nanoscience is something which is multidisciplinary. It involves any science and technology that just studies very, very tiny things. That's not, that's not something new. We have been, we have knowing it with this word, we have been using nanotechnology during the past centuries. And one, one example, one, one good example is our devices. Just all the transistors and all the electronic devices in our computers and phones are made of pieces that are nanometer size. So it's actually nanotechnology. And uh, right now, uh, so especially in the future and also right now, we, we will be able to enjoy very nice products or very nice applications of nanotechnology that so, so this amazing coating and something uh, and many other things as well. So that's all for today. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very fun talk. Um, are there any questions for speakers? Yes. What controls the color of gold nanoparticle solution? Oh, uh, yeah, I think what uh, I said that before coming here. Yes. Uh, so depending on the, so the main things are the shape and um, the shape and the size. So then, so you have the, the wavelength of, of, of the light. So then you have, so basically the, the, the thing that you see is because the light scatters and go back to your eyes, right? So, uh, or like, for example, if you see this chair red is because the red, the, 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 the cloth or, or the material has absorbed all the visible light wavelengths except the red, which is reflected and used what you see. Then this reflection and absorption changes, maybe in the macro scale, no, if you just cut this into half, uh, it will have the same properties in, in terms of light interaction. But when you take a, a material and make it like five nanometers uh, size or 15 nanometer size, then the, um, this reflection and absorption changes uh, the, uh, and then you see one color or, or another. 